Hey, welcome back. Welcome back to this edition of the Pest Geek Podcast. I am your host, Frank Hernandez. Hey, we're going to be discussing a lot of things on this podcast today. Um, I've been getting a lot of messages um, and notifications and stuff from you guys out there. Um, you're wanting to know about more things than just GHP. Now, you know, uh, Stephen Van Tassel is covering wildlife. As you know, some of you may know, if you've just tuned into the podcast, you don't know much about me, but I pretty much grew up in LNO, lawn and ornamental, lawn and turf. And what I'm going to be doing is for a while, I did some stuff on lawn and turf. A lot of you guys weren't interested in it, but I find out that a huge part of my audience, about 40% of my audience now listening to me is involved in lawn and ornamental. And I'm getting asked to do stuff about lawn and ornamental uh, plants and, and lawns. And uh, I got a request from Canada to do something on organic lawn care since they're experiencing, especially in the uh, southeast part of Canada, uh, bans on pesticides. So I decided, you know, it's time to shake things up a little bit, change it up a bit. Um, a lot of the stuff that you guys enjoyed uh, from the original podcast when I first started um, was the fact that I got into a lot of different things on a show. Some of you didn't like that. And you know what? The reality is that the industry is a whole lot more uh, about uh, what's happening around us that most of you don't know about, that you don't want to know about. Uh, but I am your host, and I'm here to bring you things that you haven't heard about, don't know about, wouldn't like to know, wish you never found out about. Uh, but, you know, my, it's my responsibility, my duty as the pest geek of the pest control industry. I am the pest geek. There is no other pest geek podcast but mine. I wanted to go ahead and get into a lot of things that are happening, especially news. There's a lot of stuff going on in the news that you guys are not aware of. And especially, uh, you know, stuff that maybe a, a, a homeowner is listening to, but maybe a property manager is listening to this. Uh, maybe there's a manager of an association or a large residential complex. There are many, many people listening to this podcast besides the pest control industry looking for guidance on what to do. I got people calling me all the time. Hey, I heard your podcast on roaches and yeah, I've had three companies out here and none of them have been able to solve it. And I guess you're probably right. Do you have somebody uh, that can you can recommend um, that could probably help me? Sure, we've got a network of thousands of people across uh, the U.S. There's many groups that I'm on. I can always give a referral. So, hey guys, things are happening. People are listening to the podcast. People are getting interested. Uh, there are people who would like to know more about termite. Unfortunately, I'm not a termite guy. I don't know what to tell you about termites. I got a hard time identifying a termite uh, because I don't deal with it. That's not my specialty. But I do know an awful lot about plants and about plant pathology and insects on plants. Uh, lawn care. Um, you know, things that I've been involved with and, and that would probably help a lot of people. So we're going to be getting into a lot of things. Um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, discuss today is there is a new revised method for the national level listed uh, species biological evaluation of conventional pesticides. Man, that is a mouthful. Uh, the EPA last year came up with new ways that they're going to look at getting products approved and it's based on the endangered species act now if you guys remembered the whole thing changed when the endangered species act uh came into play and a lot of things changed especially rodenticides well now they're going to be evaluating. I got links to all this, by the way, on my podcast. Uh, you can go to the page of this podcast that you're listening to right now. I'm going to include them in the video version of this podcast. But I just wanted for you guys to know that, hey, things are changing the way things are going to be registered and it's only getting worse. So What's ahead of us? And what I keep telling people and I keep discussing with people on my podcast and people that I talk to any chance I get is, listen, guys, understand that as pest control people, and I want owners to know this and I want homeowners to know it and the end consumer that is listening to me um, that buys pest control service that is going to buy a pesticide. Look, 80% of you guys out there buy a pesticide. 80% of homeowners 
will do it themselves. Only 20% ever hire a pest control professional. But guess what? You and I are both caught in the middle of this battle. You're caught in the middle of this pesticide battle. See, the, the attack is not on our industry. Uh, people are not attacking the pest control industry. They're attacking all of the pesticides and primarily the pesticides that are used in agriculture. Here is the problem. Uh, when I get to heaven, gonna, I'm, God's going to tell me, what about this and this? And I'm going to say, God, but God, here is the problem. This is my one of my phrases that people have noticed that I have a friend who tells me, you know, I, I can hear it coming. Here is the problem. Here is the problem. If an insecticide gets banned for agricultural use, then most likely the manufacturer is going to withdraw the registration of that product for residential use. Why? Because it is very, very expensive to the tune of about a hundred, about 1.5 to a $1.5 billion to register a product in the U S and provide it to you. So when something gets canceled in agriculture, it's going to trickle every product that we have just about every, I can say with almost absolute certainty, 99.9% of every product we use in the home first first used in agriculture and is a hand-me-down from agriculture, okay? So when something gets banned, the one that's going to feel it the most is the consumer because all of a the sudden there is now a pesticide ban really on Roundup. And have you noticed that you go into the stores now and you have all new different products of Roundup and, and, and herbicide products because glyphosate is under attack. And all of a sudden, these manufacturers came out with new products. Here's the problem with a lot of these new products. They don't work the same as Roundup. There's going to be a learning curve. You're going to be stuck with a product. You're saying, hey, you used to kill it. Now I got to apply it every week when I used to apply it once a month. There's going to be an enormous amount of application of these Armory registered products, these new safer products, these new you know eco-friendly products. There's going to be a huge learning curve for you as a homeowner. Guess what? As professionals, you're going to call us and we're going to be limited. Our hands are going to get shackled because of this. The public is going to pay the ultimate price for a lot of these bans that are happening in agriculture when it's not our fault. We just got in the crossfire. It's no different than the pharmaceutical industry, okay, and doctors. The doctors are caught in the middle and we as patients, we pay for the price for these issues that are happening in these industries. And this is why I'm, I'm sounding the alarm. This is why I'm talking about it. You know, it's not a pandemic. There's nothing that we need to go crazy. But understand that when you're voting to ban a pesticide, you're cutting your own throat. Okay. You're eventually going to be end up with a problem like northern or eastern Canadians that in Europe, that the price of pest control is going to go through the roof to do pest control. Because when you ban products and it creates IPM and you need to use real IPM, real integrated pest management like they do in hospitals, like they do in, in, in high-level facilities where a pesticide cheaply sprayed around a property isn't going to cut it because you can no longer do it, the price of pest control services are going to go through the roof. That's the reality. So understand that what we're talking about. Hey, if you want to support this podcast, do me a favor. Go to pestgeekpodcast.com now. Hit the donate button or simply go to go to Patreon slash Podcast and go ahead and support us. If you want to keep this ad free and you want me to continue to do uh, the talk that I have where I am not beholden to any pesticide manufacturer, any manufacturer of products in the pest control industry, okay? Then support us because guess what? We've got experts that want to come on this podcast and talk about things, but guess what? They want to get paid for their time. And all of you want to get paid for your time. Everybody wants to get paid for their time. So go ahead and go ahead and support us on this. Now, when we talk about um, EPA fines that uh, come down when a misuse of a product is done. The EPA has the right to fine you. Most states' fines are in line with the EPA. Uh, here is a Georgia man that pleaded guilty to using a restricted pesticide bait to kill coyotes. Okay, here, here is Atlanta. Um, uh, this is a United States. I'm going to take off my glasses because I can't see with or without my glasses. I, I need bifocals, trifocals. Uh, I'm going to need quifocals pretty soon. Uh, Terry Foster has been sentenced to pay a whopping $1,000 fine 
for the one count of violating the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, known as the FIFRA Act, by lacing deer carcasses with a restricted, highly poisonous pesticide in order to bait and kill coyote. In other words, he was using the, the deer carcasses to uh, control coyotes, and he laced them, and he was fined a whopping $1,000 for this violation that is gross and neglectful. Uh, on his part but these are the people guys that are causing the problems for us so yes it is not the pest control industry causing all this damage to the environment doing these little things getting fined sure are there corrupt people in the pest control industry there's corrupt people in any industry but it is not the majority of us when these fines get handed down you will find out it's usually an individual that is not linked to a pest control company that he did it on his own uh, he created his own product and his own bait. Listen, guys, that is extremely dangerous to do. You do, do not want to go creating your own baits using products and, you know, modifying them because you can get somebody seriously injured. Now, ESA, the Entomological Society of America, has come up with a new certification. That's right. The Public Health Entomology Certificate from the Entomological Society of America. This is the same society that brings you um, the ACE certification. Now has one for personal. It's a personal credential. Uh, this is personal credentialing in the future of professional pest management and vector control. Earning your public health entomology PHE certificate can lead to better visibility, opportunities, and jobs. Check him out. I got links to all this, guys, on the podcast. You can see it um, uh, there. We're, we're going to have links to all this. So if you see us on this video or you go to pestgeekpodcast.com, if you're probably listening on any podcast app, it's probably going to be there too. Um, I, I want to give a big, 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 big shout out uh, to uh, Pete Chopin. Uh, Pete Chopin is the owner, um, the head honcho over there at Chopin Pest Control. If you've read his articles on PMP Magazine, um, he's also in many of the groups. He publishes a lot. Here's a guy, by the way, you didn't know this about Pete. He's got a broad uh, broadcasting background, okay? And he's writing articles. You know, I don't have a broad broadcasting background, but I'm doing a podcast. I can't write to save my life, and you guys know it. Uh, if you watch what I write on Facebook, if you watch what I write on my blogs, you will find a million grammatical errors. This guy's taken up to writing and writing articles for PMP Magazine, and he writes a lot of them. But he's got a background. Um, if he would ever decide to do a podcast, uh, it would be freaking phenomenal. So, Pete, I'm goading you to do a podcast uh, about the pest control industry and not just write. Maybe you just make your articles, you know, a, a vocal podcast. Um, but he, do, he did a, a cultivate a positive company culture. Uh, and in this year for Christmas, he started handing out uh, awards uh, with some checks, I believe, attached to them uh, for the uh, salesman of the year, most valuable person of the year and employee of the year. So big, big, big shout out to Pete. Um, that guy contributes a lot to our industry uh, in the form of writing and leading us. And, you know, if he's not doesn't have a little company to sneeze at. I think he's probably doing like 1.2 million. Uh, the last number he released last year. Uh, I remember watching Pete, by the way. We, me and him started up about the same time uh, in the industry, as far as the business. Uh, I think in 2009 when he started up, I, I think we're on the same time. Uh, and he used to publish all his figures of what he was doing that month and what he and it was known as the Chopin um, Chronicles, I believe it's the, the Chopin Chronicles. So I used to follow I've been following this guy for a long time. Uh, freaking amazing. He probably writes a book about growing a pest control business. It would probably be a bestseller because he knows what he's doing. I mean, you don't get to grow to 10, 12 routes, um, you know, having 1.2, 1.5 million bucks uh, if you don't know what you're doing. So big shout out to him. Uh, the women in professional pest management, guys, is having an international women in pest management leadership forum. Manchester uh, Grand Hyatt, San Diego, California. 
presented by MPMA and sponsored by Bayer. So uh, May the 13th through the 15th, uh, 2020, San Diego, California, just right around the corner. Uh, the Manchester Grand Hyatt, by the way, they do have a phone number somewhere uh, on here that you can call. If not, just check out the link on my site. Google it. You should be able to find it. Not a big deal. But I, I think this is really cool that women are making a, a real dent in this industry because I've been saying it for a long time that I wish more women got involved. Uh, guys, women are more emotionally intelligent than we are. They know how to relate better to people uh, than we do in sales. They do phenomenal. They do way better, I think, than men do. Uh, in the home where I know for a fact, okay, that 90% of people that I deal with in the home and I've dealt with are usually the, the women and having that interaction and be able to relate. So kudos to them for uh, doing this and getting more involved and having a leadership summit. Uh, they've been getting together. I've talked to now, I, my mind escapes me. Um, I was speaking to her the other day uh, on, on, their, on their conference and now I lost my name, but I will find it and give it to you. They have a, a, a great Facebook group. By the way, just Google Facebook group. I have one. But I put one up and it's never been active because, you know, the reality is women rather talk to women than be in a men's group. Uh, so, hey, you know, it's kind of like going to a hair salon. But anyway, go check that out. Uh, lawn and Landscape, by the way, if you know the PCT 100, uh, Lawn and Landscape has a P, uh, basically it's called the Lawn and Landscape 100. And a lot of the companies that you know about uh, that are in pest control, like Massey Services, do about $71 million worth of lawn care a year. They're here, uh, the Weed Man, uh, Brightview uh, Lawn Care, which remember there was a big merger in the industry um, between East Coast and West Coast, and they became Brightview. Uh, they're the largest uh, land, lawn, lawn care company in the country, uh, grossing, I believe, um, $2 billion, $2.3 billion. Um, True Green is the next biggest company at $1.3 billion. And you, so you, if you're interested in lawn care, you want to know who the players are uh, in this industry, go ahead and check those guys out. Um, oh, this is so exciting. Turf Magazine just announced that um, Penn State, by the way, which I read a lot of Penn State articles from their entomology department. I think they have a great, if you're in the Northeast, they're probably the more active ones. Um, on the West Coast, I've kind of looked at UC Berkeley. And in the South, I'm, I'm going to be impartial uh, to University of Florida, UF entomology. Uh, but if you want to really find out, if you're somebody out there, guys, uh, that is really wanting to find out about information, you need to look at your local state entomology department uh, because they have the most information about what is happening in your area. And then the next thing to do is deal with the extension service. Okay. If you want to get the information that is happening, that is more academic. So if you're really, really interested in getting a, a different view, I understand a lot of you guys are going to have issues uh, with university sites because you say, well, they're mostly left wing. Uh, you know, they're they're getting into the, you know, nonsense about the ecology and there's not science based. Listen, most entomologists that I talk to and most pathologists um that I personally talk to at UF and at our extension service don't have that view. I think you, the generalizing of that is just really unfair uh, that most of the stuff that comes out from a university study is biased. Um, it is not true. That is not the case for every case. You have to read the information. You have to judge for yourself. You have to look at the data. But this is really interesting because they got a new online series uh, for landscape workers, understand that if you're a landscaper and you're trying to hire people and getting them trained is a problem if you don't have a curriculum, just like if you don't have a curriculum uh, in the pest control industry, which, by the way, you know, me and a couple of other guys are doing stuff like this. And it's great to have the diversity outside of the university where you can't go. Listen, I talk to people all the time. Tell me I can't send my guys to training. I got to give them online CUs. See, the, the, the one man show is not going to see the value in this. The one man show is going to say, I just get my CEUs, that's it. But when you have five, six, seven employees and you got to create a curriculum to train them, 
It's great to have these resources online that you can send them to go get it and they can do it on their own time in their home. And on my group, it's funny because I'll ask two thirds of people in another group if they want online training and they would pay for it uh, at a full price for a conference the other day. I, I put this out and in other groups, they said no. In my group, two thirds said yes. So the people that are listening to me are people that are into the online thing and people that are not in listening to me are usually more favoring the going to a physical location. But when you have a conference and you got to go physically there and you can't send your six reps, your techs and your salespeople and your office staff, it is great to bring that information back and have it in the office on, 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 on demand of what you learned in the conference. Uh, in case you can't articulate what you learned in the conference. So, hey guys, different strokes, different strokes for different folks. Use what's available. So they created this uh, program for online training for landscape workers on plant health and proper uh, equipment, you know, usage, um, basic pruning, basic mulching. It's great stuff. I'm, I'm glad to see that you know universities are starting to take this online training thing seriously because they're going to fall behind. All right, now, I'm excited about this product. It's called, uh, it's a product from Insects Limited. Um, and this is called Foresight. It is, it's called the Sight Trap powered by Foresight. What this is, is a basically a, a big monitor that you hang, especially like for flies, and it has a camera inside. So when the insect gets trapped, you can immediately see from your smartphone what is actually in that trap through a camera for monitoring. Now, this is not for the average residential home, guys. This is not for that. This is for a commercial industrial application where you may have a 100,000 square foot plant of food service and you need to know what happens and what. So if you've got, let's say, an Indian meal moth going in there and you have, you know, grains, you need to know that you have an Indian meal moth like that. So this is what this is about, about uh, having that access to that information in real time when it's happening, not waiting for your weekly inspection or your monthly inspection. But it, it is uh, uh, the, the wave that this might be able, hey, to put a camera inside a rodent station and see what activity is happening with that rodent, why he's not eating that bait, why he's eating another bait, why he's not choosing one over the other. Uh, just really interesting stuff. Okay, so Andrew uh, Tawil, you know, uh, the podcast we did with um, Ring Boost uh, a couple of weeks ago, calls me up uh, this weekend. I says, hey, Frank, we want to do something special for your listeners because um, we know, hey, you're going through hard times. Guess what, guys? The phone and internet and all the technology that we haven't used is going to be what we're going to be using in the next couple of weeks and probably the next couple of months until this thing blows over. Um, so he, he called me up and he says, Hey, would you be interested in promoting, uh, our ring boost service and, um, for your clients? And we're doing a 15% discount for everybody that signs up, um, offer is going to expire August 31st of 2020. So they're extending this to the end of the year. They're, they're looking out at this as this might be a long time problem. And so if you're interested in, uh, getting either a toll free number for your business or getting a vanity number, or getting some type of local, easy to remember number. If you didn't listen to the podcast, you won't know what I'm talking about, but go ahead and listen to that podcast. And then go on. He gave us a special link. Uh, it's going to be a ringboost.com slash pest. And in order to save the 15%, you need to put in the discount code of pest15. It's P E S T 1515. And you're going to save 15% on anything you want on all those services. Just make sure you put in and visit the link that he has given us because that way we can track it and I can get my commission because yeah, full transparency, I'm getting paid. Uh, so, but if you guys want it, you need it and you feel this is the right time to save 15% on this, go ahead and log on and get that done. And uh, Andrew, I thank you for reaching out to me uh, and letting us know and letting my audience know what you guys are doing for them. So greatly appreciate it. And so now I want to get into my main topic that I want to talk about, which is the organic lawn care. 
And I'm going to do this probably in a three-part series. I did one of these October 5th of 2015. It's called I Want an Organic Lawn Care Service. So we're going now five back, four and a half years, four years and a little bit uh, when I did this. And what was available at that time? Um, there isn't a whole lot more available in Orlando in organic lawn care since I first talked about it almost five years ago. There are some newer products. There are some products created, especially for that area in Ontario, uh, in Quebec, uh, in the Northeast. There seems to be a bigger activity like in Massachusetts because there are bands. So companies are starting to provide organic. There is a company called Sunday.com that created a product. Now, mind you, it's a fertilizer product. It's not going to control weeds. It's not going to control diseases. What they're claiming is that if you improve the soil biology, you will get a better looking lawn with less products. I agree. You improve the soil biology. Um, I have to look at the label and find out exactly what's in there. But they're claiming fish kelp, uh, and kelp and fish emulsion and all this stuff, which we use molasses and and creating those sugars and, and having that in the ground and the ability for that soil biology to be greater is you need to look at the soil first. So I did this podcast. You can go back. I'm going to have a link to it. I want an organic uh, lawn care service. If you go to my website at uh, pestgeekpodcast.com and you go to the little uh, search, uh, you know, the little magnifying glass, there you can search for these, uh, these articles and we'll go from there. But one of the things that I want to discuss about, um, there are eight, pretty much eight basics of, of lawn care that you really have to master. I remember when I did that podcast and I want an organic lawn care and then I did another podcast of getting into lawn care because a lot of GHP guys wanted to get into lawn care and they just didn't know. I remember a friend who, who we talk pretty much once a month now. Uh, we chat every couple of, uh, of weeks. Um, he has his own business and he wanted to get into lawn care and he consulted me on it. Hey, what do you think? And I said, look, it's going to depend on the cultivar. You're really going to have to become familiar with the cultivar. You're going to have to become familiar with the diseases in your specific area. All of these things. Well, two years later, you know, he's now doing his his lawn care thing. And I asked him, so um, so you're going to be, they're going to be like the company is in, in, a, in, a, in a transition right now. And um, I asked, so you're going to do lawn care? And he says, heck no. That, that is way too much. Trouble. You know what his com comment to me was at the beginning of this when he heard this? Is, Man, you made it sound so difficult. I said, it is. You got to learn eight things um, and five more things that you need in addition to what you do in GHP to be able to do lawn care. Lawn care is not easy. Lawn care isn't for everybody. This is why most people should stick to general household pests uh, because it is a lot of work. It is a lot of product. You're going to apply. Dude. 94, 95% more product with lawn care uh, than you'll ever apply with GHP. If you're an IPM company with, with GHP, you will use 99.9% 9 less chemical with, with, with GHP doing IPM than you ever will with lawn care. Uh, lawn care is chemical intense. I can understand why people want to ban them because you're putting fungicides. Uh, you know, you're going to have to use two to three herbicides. I mean, God forbid you're using 2,4-D and atrazine still. I mean, that thing is barbaric to use that. <laughs> you know, guys, I know I'm going to get hate mail for that. But really, I mean, you're using atrazine, which is a 50-year-old product that contaminates the water and in a high percentage of cases uh, where you're using a high concentrate. It's actually a restricted use product, an RUP, and you need a special license to apply it. Why the heck would you use that when you have modern products? I'll tell you why. When I Here's the answer I get. Man, have you seen the price on that product? I mean, have you seen the price of Celsius? Because it's an agency product. You can only buy it at one price. Everybody pays the same price. You don't get a discount on it. These are agency prices. I remember when we first started using, um, uh, which is uh, azoxystrobin, um, the, 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 it's a Bayer, I think it was a Bayer product at the time, uh, the original product. And um, it, that thing was $300 a pound, a bottle. A little bottle like that was $300. We started using it when it first came out. Um, we are using everything that comes out modern. The reason is less toxicity, less exposure, less pounds per, per thousand square feet that you need. They're more eco-friendly. The products today that they're coming out with today or have come out within the last 10 years is going to be way more eco-friendly than the products that you had 50 years ago. I mean, when you're using a 50-year-old product, that is an old product. Atrazine, in, when you have weed and feed, that's what's in there. It's atrazine. That stuff is like, you know, 
not the best thing to use. Plus, if you use it in 95 degree temperatures in South Florida, you're going to burn a lawn. I get more people calling me saying, hey, I burned my lawn after using weed and feed. Yeah, no duh. You used it when it was 20, 95 degrees, uh, which the label tells you that you shouldn't be using it past 85 degrees. So if you don't read the label and you don't understand what's in that label and you're not studying that label, you're going to make a mistake with that product that could potentially injure the person injure the property, the lawn, or somebody else. So these are the things that we're discussing on this podcast, guys, that nobody else in the world is discussing. Nobody has the pants, the pantalones, to discuss these issues. I, your pest geek, are taking on things that nobody wants to comment on, nobody wants to talk about. So eight basic things. You need to know which cultivar you have. If you're in the Northeast, and we're going we're gonna to be discussing maybe uh, some Southern lawns in the next podcast and some other things. And I'm going to be discussing products you can use uh, for organic. I'm going to be discussing the limitation. This is going to be an extensive conversation for a while because I can't be simplistic about this. It isn't that easy. It isn't extremely hard that you need a PhD to do it. Obviously, you don't because I did it. So if you're needing a PhD to do this, I could have never done it. I'm not that smart. But I'm telling you from experience that you need to learn this and put this under your belt first. You need to understand the cultivar. Which cultivar are you going to be using? If you're using cool season grasses, guys, listen to me. Lawns in sun that are in full sun. They're medium to high maintenance lawns, but they're the best for full sun. Kentucky bluegrass. Okay, now you've got Kentucky bluegrass, tall fescue, perennial ryegrass, um, fine fescues in the Northeast. These are all uh, standard lawns. And when you know which is the best one that you're going to be dealing with, which is the best one for your customer, the customer is, which lawn should I install? I get this question all the time. Install the one that is adequate for the conditions. We're going to be discussing these conditions. If you got lawns with low, uh, sun, you know, uh, you know, the moderate sun, you don't have like full sun where it gets sun from the sunrise to sunset. That is full sun. Okay. Sunrise to sunset is full sun. Maybe you have, uh, you got sun maybe uh, two-thirds of the day. Then maybe you want to go with a fine fescue, okay? All of these are going to have different diseases, different problems, different things. Uh, lawns that have shade but are well-drained. You want to use maybe Kentucky bluegrass uh, fine fescue, okay? They will handle partial shade. Partial shade is probably half the day. So maybe from 12 noon on, uh, till six, seven, eight o'clock at night, you have sun in that side of the house, but early in the morning, you don't, that's what pretty much we're getting into, um, partial shade. And if you got shade, saber, rough bluegrass, uh, and Kentucky bluegrass in quotes is tolerant to shade. Now shade is not complete shade. And if it's wet, that's going to be a problem. Rough shade, uh, saber, rough bluegrass, will be your best option. If you start putting a lawn that doesn't handle shade very well and you start putting trees or you're putting it around trees where they're heavily shaded all day long, yeah, it's going to last a year, one season, and then it's going to die out. And if, well, in the Northeast, it doesn't matter if it dies out, but you're going to be doing a lot of reseeding um, in, in, the, uh, in the summer months and, and in the spring uh, to get that back. But you need to understand that you need to put the right plant in the right place. That's number one. We're going to discuss... Um, warm season grasses on the next episode, but your soil, what type of soil do you have? Is it acidic? Is it neutral? Is it alkaline? You need to know your agronomy. Learn to know, find out the best way you find out. Listen, call your, your local extension service in that County because, and you speak to an agent that handles commercial and residential landscapes. And those agents know roughly what the pH is around that area. So that is the number one way that you find out about what it is that your soil is. Is it alkaline? Because if it's, if it's alkaline, it has a high pH, products will get neutralized. This is the problem we have in South Florida. We got rain all year round. We have sun all year round. And we don't have snow on the ground. And we have very, 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 very alkaline soil. So if we got grubs and we use a product like Dilox here in Florida, guess what? Three days is the half-life on Dilox in our soil compared to a full seven days. The label says you can't make a reapplication for at least seven days. What do we do? We can't reapply it again. 
Mm, we got now a problem. See the problem that we're having when we only have one product left that controls grub in the industry because all organophosphates are gone and this is really the only effect? You said people use triple crown. Yeah, look at triple crown. If it's the liquid, I think it has an RUP label on it, restricted use product for lawns. So yeah, a lot of products you may be able to use it, but they have a restricted use. You're gonna need a special license or you can't apply to residential landscape. So when these products go off the market, you're up a creek without a paddle. All right, so mowing. You got to know exactly for your cultivar what the mowing height and the mowing frequency is. Typically, this is gonna be across the board, but when your lawn grows more than a third, you need to mow it. So if it's a one and a half inch lawn and it grows to two inches, you need to mow it. For some of you guys, hey, that's gonna be mean bi-weekly mowing. But if you're mowing it every week in the Northeast, you're probably going to be mowing that weekly. That's going to be your Sunday morning ritual or Saturday morning ritual. If you don't have the right mowing frequency and your lawn becomes overgrown, you're going to have to start having rotting issues. And your customer is going to complain that you need to apply a fungicide. And you're saying, hey, look, it isn't a fungal problem. It's a rotting problem. There's difference between rotting and fungal pathogens being active. Usually the infection in the rotting is a secondary to the actual infection that is happening because the it's rotting. Think about it this way. If you're walking around with a wet shoe and you put your foot in that wet shoe every single day and you don't dry out that shoe, you're never going to get rid of that tungle, the fungal infection. The fung Your toe doesn't have an infection. Your toe is rotting because you constantly leave it in water. Dry the shoe. Then you put on the medication to deal with the secondary fungal issue. But if you solve removing your foot... Guess what? The chances of you getting another fungal foot problem with a, a nail getting infected is going to be very low to none. Okay, so these are the issues. Understand mowing. If you're a St. Augustine guy and you're, you're here in the, the southern part of the United States where you have a warm season grass, St. Augustine is three to four inches, right? You can't let it grow to six inches, the size of your hand. You will start getting rotting issues and happening. So, it needs to be mowed weekly here in, in the South. People wait two weeks to mow the lawn. This is why your lawn looks like crap because you can't wait two weeks to mow a Southern lawn. It is way too long in the summer. You can get away with that in the winter. You're not going to get away with that in the summer and expect a good looking lawn and expect, listen, for a lawn care company to come in and say, I want my lawn to look great. There is no way he's going to make your lawn look great if your cultural practices aren't spot on. Aeration. You need to aerate your lawn. If you're not aerating, especially after you've had that lawn has been compacted and has been hardened over the winter with, you know, the snow on the ground. Hey, guys, aerate the lawn. It's by poking holes in the lawn. It creates these holes, allows oxygen, fertilizer, and nutrients to penetrate to that level. And you should be doing that once a year minimum aeration irrigation spot on you need to do an irrigation inspection if you're a lawn care professional and you're getting into and you're not inspecting that irrigation and you don't understand how much water that needs i have battles listen all the time with landscapers who do not understand irrigation who see a yellow lawn and what they do is add more minutes to it saying your lawn needs more water the lawn does not need more water the lawn if it's yellow usually has a fungal infection or a disease problem a disease problem or an insect problem so you need to understand irrigation, do irrigation inspection. If you're a lawn care professional, if you're doing mowing and trimming and you're not inspecting or managing that, that irrigation, there's going to be a problem. If you're a lawn care professional applying chemicals, fertilizers, and you're not inspecting that system and you're not seeing that it's optimal, that all those heads and nozzles are, are rotating correctly, that the heads and nozzles have the right amount of water coming out of them, Okay the amount of volume that that lawn needs, the amount of time, the frequency during the week. If you're not on top of this, you're never going to have a great. What is the secret that we micromanage all this stuff? And we have to have battles with landscapers and the customer sometimes because they're telling me they need water every day. In the South, you do not need water every day. That is a myth. Two times a week, one inch a week. Maybe if you, if you, if you need a third time, you do a manual application doing stress when there's no rain, temperatures are 104 degrees and no rain in sight. I get it. You might have to, but you know how many with percentage we do that on 1%. I'm an expert at managing 1%. That's what we need to get to, to be a professional. All right. So what will you have? Um, we've got the light. 
We've got the mowing. We've got the irrigation. We have the aeration. Um, next week, I'm going to get into nutrition. And we're going to get into nutrition because nutrition is probably one of the easiest things to do for a lawn. If you do the right nutrition, you get the right balance of products. You reduce the need for that lawn to need um, fungicides and certain types of fertilizers. And we, and we do have a good amount of organic fertilizers available. So on next week's episode, we're going to get into nutrition and then we're going to get into insecticides and we're going to get into herbicides and we're going to get into fungicides and we're going to be talking even of some synthetic options that could possibly be eco-friendly. So until next time, this is Frank Tepeski wishing you a pistacular day.